Oh yeah, Belt Deloda, and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben, coming at you very late at night, and I can't wait to go to sleep. Anyways, the world of the Expanse is the living, breathing future. In the 24th century, humans have achieved the means by which to efficiently travel and live throughout the soul system. Technology in the future has limited the threat of injury and disease and has made communication throughout space a seamless endeavor. And yet, limited resources and security dilemmas hold the powers that be on Mars, Earth, and the Belt in perpetual conflict. Yes, the world of the Expanse hangs ever so steadily on the brink of war. And in this chaotic future, because the ever-widening scope of humankind's endeavors has made its reality subject to new and marvelous threats, human armies stand more active and capable than ever. The Earth is a small place, my friends. In our little bubble, humans become giants. But when the human world opens up unto infinity, giants give way to gods and monsters. And everyone in between can only pray that when the beasts come for the spoils, that there are gods who find honor in the cause of their survival. To the great fortunes of humanity, the deities of man fancy themselves some of Sol's greatest defenders. I talk of the angels of the great darkness, the soldiers of the starry night, no less among them the Martian Marine Corps. Once, when speaking of the MMC, UN Deputy Secretary General Christian of Vassarala cautioned, quote, they fly at the speed of war. And I don't know what that means, and I certainly don't make science very good, but that sounds pretty fast. As part of the larger Martian Congressional Republic Armed Forces, Martian Marines serve in a variety of important roles throughout Mars' territories, working to secure the present and future of Mars and its peoples. And if the Marines are Martian gods, the body of their subject savior, then the Force Recon Marines, an elite unit within the MMC, well, they're the blood. Force Recon Marines are perhaps the most feared and revered warriors in the Soul System, legendary for the silver and red Goliath-powered armor they wear in battle. Today, in honor of the gods who feast on Earth's sky and drink their rivers dry, I offer you, humble listener, good servant of humanity, this comprehensive breakdown of the armor's features. And as you probably expected, spoiler alert, though I will try my best not to say any major spoilers out loud. The first thing you have to know here is that there are actually different versions of Martian Marine Goliath power armor, though this is laid out in more detail in the books than in the show. In the show, we at least know that up until the Ganymede incident in Season 2, Bobby Draper and her team wore Goliath Mark III power armor. But later in Season 3, we see hints, specifically on the armor storage units, that they might be using newer versions at this point, such as the Mark IV and V armors. The reason it's hard to tell is because all of the armors look mostly the same, with each newer version probably only providing firmware upgrades that make the suit work faster and more intuitively. This video is inclusive of all versions of Goliath powered armor. Almost all of the information that you hear in this video comes from me simply watching every episode of the show and taking lots and lots of notes, though I will fill in general information where necessary using the book as a resource. The show never states what the armor is composed of, but using information from the books, it's probably a titanium and ceramic composite. Though seemingly one piece, the suit is actually made up of multiple pieces from van braces to chest protector to boots, and is broken up very much like plate armor to help its wearer move more freely. The gloves of the suit are less armored than the other parts in order to allow users greater dexterity. The gloves strike a good balance between function and protection. They allow Martian Marines to grab objects or crush glass with their hands. The suit's bulky boots help Marines over rough terrain, and as they walk, you can hear how heavy they must be. Did you know that Martian Marines always train at 1G Earth gravity? So this begs the question, how heavy is the suit overall? Well, book sources say it's about 400 kilograms or about 882 pounds. Though I'm not sure if this is true for the Goliath suits we see in the show, which seem rather thin and compact. Though I have read that the armor in the books is designed to fit in confined spaces, so maybe it's just very densely packed. In any case, the suit is a tight space. As Bobby Draper states, You kind of grow into it. But is the suit easy to use? Well, I assume the answer is basically yes, but maybe not easy to master. 
I say it's easy to use in a basic sense because when the Belters steal a few Goliath armors, they are instantly able to operate them. Though biometric authorization is required to fire the suit's weapons, meaning the Belters couldn't operate the guns because the suits weren't theirs. That said, inbuilt hydraulics make it so the heavy suit isn't difficult to move in for anyone. That's not to say there's no loss in agility or speed at all while wearing their armor, but if necessary, they can sprint while zooming their HUD in on a target and firing their weapon. The suit is that intuitive. Of course, no one is going to wield the suit as adeptly as the Martian Marines, who constantly work out, who, unlike the average Martian, train at 1G, and who, let's be honest in all likelihood, have superior genetics to the average human. To take the suit off, a user simply powers off and removes their helmet and the suit disengages, though I imagine there might be some additional signal to initiate this process as well. Finally, under the armor, Force Recon Marines wear one-piece undersuits that are made up of a stretchy, durable synthetic material, as we see here on Martian T'Challa. This suit must be comfortable because Martian Marines never seem to take them off. But maybe we can just chalk this up to that they're Martian Marines, they're high class, they always want to look their best, they're not some mobile infantry scrubs showering together. The brain of the armor is the helmet, inside the face shield of which the first thing you'll notice are two lights, one on either side of the jaw. These lights can be turned red in low light situations. These helmets have comms in them which allow the marines to communicate with other boots on the ground or with ships in orbit. Stickman, you're getting a little close to the UN line. Back off, maintain two clicks, minimum separation. Understood, Overwatch, Stickman, one out. Though marine voices can be heard through their face shields. If anyone else but me comes through that door, you put them on the ground. Though when the comms are down and one marine is trying to speak to another marine through both face shields in the middle of a battle zone, it can be hard to hear one another. The face shield itself is more than just a window. It functions as a heads-up display or HUD for the helmet, which is controlled through blinks and eye movements. The face shield displays all sorts of important information to its user, as fed to it from its sensor packages, which I guess are like apps. The screen shows the armor's health and its battery life, and will notify its user when the battery is low or when it's switching to reserve power. The screen also shows the amount of radiation the suit is absorbing, and I believe it monitors vital signs too, as we see on Bobby's face shield after our team was attacked on Ganymede. An atmospheric sensor in the helmet can determine information about planets, including conditions such as gases in the atmosphere and temperature, and other tech can simulate how a place might progress over different amounts of time, whether 40, 80, or 100 years into the future, and provide a visual representation of that progression on screen. More essentially, the screen provides terrain mapping, and it can actually identify individual buildings and other objects. It can spot targets at a distance, even inside buildings, and zoom in on them up to at least 160 times magnification. The screen can also mark targets or enemies and identify things about them such as their distance away, the weapons they are carrying, and their threat level, which I assume is a calculation of how likely the target is to attack and how lethal that target is. When under threat, the helmet also contains an alarm that will alert its wearer to danger. During the Ganymede incident, we also see that back on the Shiroko in orbit, that Lieutenant Sutton can track the movements of both his Marines and the UN Marines from a screen. I wonder if this tracking is being done by the ship's tech, or if the tech in the ship is just transmitting information from the suits on the ground. If the latter, this would mean that the suits are synced with the ship and are integrated to work with it. Which would be cool! We also see Private Richard Travis's face shield identify a drone. It tries to identify the type of drone it is, and can't, but only because this drone is probably advanced protogen tech. Nonetheless, Travis's face shield is still able to identify the drone's armaments, altitude, and speed. Additionally, as we see from a screen in the Scirocco, the Martian Marine boarding team from the Donager had cameras in their helmets for recording video of missions. I'm sure such tech is standard in all MMC Force Recon powered armor as well. The face shield of the Goliath suit is also capable of thermal imaging, and at one point we see Bobby read heat signatures from six levels below her in a building, though with floors obstructing them, she can't tell if they're armed or not. This thermal imaging system works with the face shield zoom function as well. Oh, and before I forget, my favorite face shield feature is its rear view camera, which of course warns, quote, objects are closer than they appear. We already know that the power armor's hydraulics help their users move and lift the suit's heavy weight. 
But obviously such strength enhancement also provides for superior power in interacting with one's environment. With Goliath armor equipped and set in bitch behave mode, Marines can easily throw other humans around. A light pimp slap from the Vambrace and Kamina drummer goes flying. The armor's hydraulics offer its user enough strength to open heavy doors and do random Hulk mad bullshit. The armor's hydraulic tech is actually somewhat self-functioning and can operate without a user, but combined with the Martian Marine, the armor is exponentially stronger. The Goliath power armor also doubles as a spacesuit as it's vacuum rated, allowing its wearer to breathe in space. Tubes connecting from the backpack to the rest of the suit seem to feed oxygen to the user. Along with its enhancements to the user's strength and adaptability, the suit also features mag locks in its gloves and boots that allow the user to stick to surfaces through the magic of magnetism. These mag locks can help users in all sorts of ways, from avoiding being thrown by explosions to scaling walls. And when the mag locks are used in concert with the suit's hydraulics, the user can accomplish all sorts of superhuman feats. One thing the mag locks might also help with is standing while in high G, which Martians often do because, well, maybe it's difficult to sit down in the Goliath armor? Or maybe they're just too cool for seat belts. Though, I suppose that one's weight is greater on the mag locks when standing up, and so doing so provides extra stability for the maglocks while trying to stay in place in high G. The Goliath armor also has thrusters in the back of its hip area and beneath its boots. The thrusters are powered by hydrazine, a colorless liquid compound made up of nitrogen and hydrogen that is often used in rocket fuels and to prepare the gas precursors used in airbags. These thrusters allow for levitation to great heights and for descending from said heights as well. An experienced power armor user can kind of pepper the thrusters to make long quick jumps and even combine the thrusters with the mag locks to prevent themselves from tumbling forward when landing jumps. The power level of the thrusters is monitored by the suit and shown on the HUD. As far as defense goes, we've already mentioned that the armor shell is a titanium and ceramic composite. We see that it can fairly easily withstand bullet fire, at least from most small arms of the time, which are designed to not be powerful enough to break through bulkheads of ships. Being able to walk through gunfire allows Martian Marines to engage in aggressive tactics as we see Draper often run into a hail of bullets to take out enemies. Additionally, the armor can help its wearer survive falls from great heights, and even if jumping down onto a platform without the use of thrusters, the boots absorb shocks and allow users to land on their feet from heights with no ill effects. And beyond all of this, we've already discussed how the HUD system can track incoming attacks and potential threats. This all said, the armor cannot defend against disaggregation. The HUD in the helmet works with the suit's weapons to provide an assortment of features, such as a targeting and lock-on system. The suit's main weapon is a multi-barrel minigun built into the right vambrace. Another F you to us lefties out there, you racist bastards. The minigun on this suit, unlike small arms of the time, can blow holes in bulkheads. As for ammo, at one point we see Bobby load her gun with 6.25mm incendiary ceaseless rounds of no particular brand, and once loaded, the ammo level is then measured by the HUD system. The Goliath armor also has an RPG launcher built into its back left side. The RPG launcher can be activated from the left vambrace and works with the suit's HUD to provide targeting, guided control, and metrics such as velocity to the user. If needed, the targeting system can lock onto and fire RPGs at multiple targets at once. The suit actually provides the user with an array of electronic targeting sites to choose from between the minigun and RPG. Finally, mounting brackets can be added onto the armor that allow the user to store further weapons and supplies, such as two NTW-08 high-explosive grenades. And remember, as we said earlier, the weapons in the Goliath armor are coded to be operated only by the suit's main user. Now I want to take some time to talk about suit maintenance. Fans of The Expanse often rave about how realistic the show's physics are, and indeed painstaking effort was put into making the science of The Expanse make sense. But the realism of the show goes beyond its physics. There was just no laziness that went into putting together any part of The Expanse's universe, and this remains true for the power armor as well. Obviously, other sci-fi franchises have featured power armor before, all the way back to the Starship Troopers novel. 
but The Expanse adds a realistic touch into the mix. The suits need constant maintenance. They need to be charged when not in use, and while plugged in back on a Martian ship, various technology is used to monitor the health of the suit's various parts. Even on the way into battle, we see technicians working to prepare the suits for conditions on the ground. But because maintenance is needed so frequently, the Marines themselves need to know how to maintain and make basic repairs to their suits. And beyond that, a Marine's suit becomes part of her. A Marine's armor is her best friend, and she must master it as she must master her life, and this includes taking care of it and knowing how it works. Okay, so does the Goliath-powered armor have any weaknesses that enemies can exploit? Well, yes, there are two significant ones that I can think of. The first is that the suit, with all of its electrical gear, can be short-circuited with an electrical shock or explosive, which temporarily disables the armor and paralyzes the wearer. Secondly, the armor isn't completely impenetrable. The faceplate seems specifically weak, and though it can take some bullet fire, it's not guaranteed to stay intact through a battle. And while the armor might hold up against human strength given an augmented human or other powerful creature, the suit can be crushed, though not easily. And by the way, the beating that the suit takes does take a toll on the wearer. At one point, the suit isn't strong enough to hold up a falling elevator, which is a difficult task even in powered armor. But alas, if this wasn't a belter in the armor here, but Draper, a Martian Marine, then perhaps she could have used the suit to save herself from the elevator. And that brings us into our conclusion. You see, there's a difficult question here about just how much of the legacy of Martian Marine powered armor is due to the suit itself and how much is due to the Martian Marine inside of it. Yeah, the suits can withstand drops from height, but even without armor, Bobby seems to be able to absorb a hard fall and keep going. Bobby uses the suit to walk casually through gunfire, but then again, when her and her team's suits get stolen, she still doesn't seem that terrified of bullets. Motherfucking thieving belters. We don't need armor for this. Take what you need and hit out. And yeah, the suit strikes enemies hard, but even with plain old fists, Bobby's right hook knocks people the feg out. Then again, we see with the belters that the armor is pretty powerful given any user. But the main point here is that Martian Force Recon Marines are badass, and they play a big role in making the Goliath-powered armor the superior warsuit that it is. Thus, while Martian Marine-powered armor is elite tech loaded with advanced capabilities, perhaps its most important feature is its human pilot. Sorry, I had to make the humans the good guys in the end. Anyways, I hope that you enjoyed that video. I tried to nail every feature, but as always, if you know of more or any ones that I miss, please do mention them in the comments below so we can get this video to be complete. Especially if you have read the books and want to offer something, maybe some sort of contradiction between the books and the show, I'd be interested to read uh, what you have to say. Anyways, if you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like. Definitely subscribe to our channel, hit that notification bell if you like this kind of content, especially if you want to see more Expanse content because there will be more on the way along with other sci-fi stuff. Um, subscribe, notification, that's a checklist. I got everything. I think I can say bye now, but I'm going to miss you all. Uh, for now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.